Good afternoon and welcome to the STI Clinical Update webinar, Syndromic Management of Sexually Transmitted Infections, Part 1, with Drs. Rosalind Plotzker, Akank Shavidia, and Eric Tang. This webinar is brought to you by the California Prevention Training Center and the California Department of Public Health. I'll give it just one more moment for folks to join. Okay, welcome again, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you again for coming to the STI Clinical Update webinar, Syndromic Management of Sexually Transmitted Infections, Part 1. My name is Dr. Kelly Johnson, Prevention Training Center and a Public Health Medical Officer with the California Department of Public Health, or CDPH. I'll be emceeing today's webinar, and I'll be going over just a few introductory slides to start us off. So first, a little bit more about the California Prevention Training Center, or CAPTC. The California PTC is a multidisciplinary training and capacity building assistance center. Our STI clinical training is sponsored by the CDC, and we're also a member of a larger national network of clinical, uh, excuse me, of STD clinical prevention training centers, or NNPTC. We provide virtual and in-person training events, technical assistance, clinical tools, and STI clinical consultation services focusing on complex STI issues in patient care. You can learn more about STI clinical training at CAPTC, as well as about the NNPTC at the web pages listed on this slide. The CAPTC also runs the STD Clinical Consultation Network. This is an online clinical consultation network or website where providers can go online and submit complex STI questions. A subject matter expert will reply either by phone or email per your request in one to five business days. Here's our financial disclosure. We have nothing to disclose. And here's our CME disclosure. This states that today's webinar is offered at 1.25 CME units. Importantly, here are the CME requirements for this webinar in order to earn those CME credits of 1.25 units. First, you must have registered for the webinar on the NNPTC site by the deadline. Second, you must attend the webinar live and in full. Unfortunately, we cannot give CME credit to those viewing the recording of this webinar, and we also cannot give credit for viewing just a part of this webinar. Attendance will be noted as you sign in to the webinar. Finally, you will need to complete a post-course survey evaluation by the deadline, which is October 26. You'll receive a link to the evaluation within 24 hours following completion of today's webinar. This email will come from training at nnptc.org, and it will go to the same email address that you use to register for today's webinar. Please be sure to check your spam and junk folders if you don't see this email in your main inbox. Our CME provider is the University of Nevada, Reno School of Medicine. If you meet CME requirements, you'll receive an email notification with a link to claim your certificate from CAPTC at UCSF.edu within four to six weeks after the post course survey evaluation deadline is, 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 has arrived. This notification is sent again to the same email address that you use to register for the webinar. And again, please be sure to check those spam and junk folders if you don't see the notification in your inbox. Okay, a couple of quick housekeeping notes about Zoom. Microphone, video, and chat will be turned off for you as attendees, but the Q&A will be turned on. To use the Q&A, click on the Q&A icon as seen here on this slide, which will be on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Once you click on the Q&A icon, you can type in your question and click send to submit. If you want to send anonymously, then you select anonymous. You'll be able to submit questions up until the last two minutes of today's webinar. Also during the webinar, I'll be reviewing the Q&A and I may answer your questions directly in the Q&A or they may be answered live during our Q&A session at the end. You can also submit any administrative questions you may have into the Q&A, and our administrative team of Elizabeth Olson and Lauren Blakely will respond. If you have any questions, speaking of Elizabeth, you can reach out to Elizabeth Olson, who is our program manager at CAPTC. Her email address is shown on this slide. <laughs> 
And now, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our three speakers for today's webinar. First, Dr. Rosalind Plotzker. Dr. Plotzker is an assistant professor in the UCSF Department of Epi and Biostats. She completed a fellowship in sexually transmitted diseases with the CAPTC and California Department of Public Health, or CDPH. She serves as a public health medical officer in the STD control branch at CDPH. Next, Dr. Akanksha Vaidya is a sexually transmitted diseases fellow with the CAPTC and CDPH. She completed her undergraduate degree in biology at Carnegie Mellon and then earned her medical degree at Cornell in New York. She subsequently completed her residency in internal medicine at Emory and came to UCSF in July of 2020 for her infectious diseases fellowship. Finally, Dr. Eric Tang is a public health medical officer for the STD control branch at CDPH. He received his medical degree at Columbia University and his Master of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley. He completed a combined internal medicine and preventative medicine residency through Kaiser San Francisco and UCSF. Okay, and without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and turn it over to Dr. Plotzker. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, let me just share my slides. So I think this is going to be a fun uh, session. Um, and let me just find that PowerPoint. All right. One second. Sorry, everybody. There it is. All right. So um, without further ado, um, it is my pleasure to start us off. So this is going to be looking at syndromic management of STIs. And this is a two-part series. Dr. Johnson kindly introduced um, me and my colleagues, um, Dr. Vedia and Dr. Tang. Um, our learning objectives for today are threefold. First, um, the first part, I'll describe the differential diagnosis and management of patients with vaginal discharge and pelvic pain. So that's gonna be case one. Um, case two, we will go over exam findings and treatment of patients with penile discharge and testicular pain. And then finally, we'll end talking about anorectal pain, and that's in the setting of a known STI. And these three cases are related, spoiler alert. Okay, so our story begins with a couple who comes into an STI clinic. The couple is Max and Sam. Uh, Max and Sam are primary partners. They've been together for three years, and they're in an open relationship. And they met through a mutual friend at a party about four years ago. Well, actually, it was kind of a party, but more like a networking happy hour. And to be honest, Max didn't want to go and then almost didn't, but he is a total introvert and he hates those kind of things. And also it was on a Tuesday, but then his friend Tom, who was organizing it, really wanted a good crowd. So Tom said he would go for an, um, so he told Tom he would go for an hour and then he was about to leave. And then Tom introduced him to Sam and the rest is history. So that is the full background of Max and Sam that you hear when you um, are in the STI clinic, okay? So let's start with Sam's sexual history. Um, Sam is a 34-year-old non-binary person um, who goes by they, them. Um, they have a gynecologic reproductive tract and they have sex with partners of all genders. They take PrEP daily. And in the last six months, they've had three partners. So they have um, had Max as the primary partner. And in addition, they had one cis male partner and one transgender male partner. They have vaginal sex with condoms intermittently um, they also have oral sex, both performing and receiving, and no receptive anal intercourse. In terms of their STI history, they have no history of herpes, gonorrhea, or syphilis, and herpes I'll have is HSV, and gonorrhea I'll have is GC. Um, they had chlamydia or CT one time. It was a cervicovaginal infection. Um, that was back in 2013. They were adequately treated with one gram of azithromycin, and they have a Mirena IUD for birth control that was placed in 2016, so they no longer have a period. They screen for bacterial STIs every six months with their PCP as part of the PrEP care, and that includes HIV, um, syphilis screening, as well as uh, urine chlamydia and uh, gonorrhea screening. So when Sam and Max come into the clinic, Sam is complaining of an unusual vaginal discharge and some pelvic pain. 
the vaginal discharge started a week ago or seven days ago, and uh, they noticed it was more copious than their normal physiologic just discharge, that it's kind of whitish green and thicker than normal, um, no specific odor. Um, in addition to that, about three days after the discharge started, Sam started developing some pelvic pain, which has been going on for the past four days, described as dull, achy, diffuse, sometimes cramping, um, and it's been worsening in severity. And now when they come into clinic, they're up to an eight out of 10 in severity. Um, and they've tried taking ibuprofen, but with very little relief. Um, they have no urinary urgency or hesitancy or dysuria. So no uh, urinary symptoms. So when thinking about pelvic pain, the first thing that you think about is the upper gynecologic tract and an anatomic approach. Um, pelvic pain can be located in different areas in the uh, upper gynecologic tract. So when you're thinking about it, think first, could this be tubo ovarian? Could there be a ovarian or be an ovarian torsion? Could this be an ectopic pregnancy or potentially salpingitis or infection of the fallopian tube? Could it be something related to the uterus? Could this be endometritis or the lining of the uterus? Could this be related to a fibroid? Or could it be potentially pregnancy related? And finally, adjacent organ structures, the bladder, could this be related to a bladder infection? Could this be related to appendicitis? It's an atypical presentation, but not unheard of, okay? Also, when considering vaginal discharge that's accompanying the pelvic pain, you can think of different organisms that might be implicated in this. So um, bacterial vaginosis, a yeast infection or candida, or trichomonas or gonorrhea, or, or just could this be a variation of physiologic discharge? Um, chlamydia is very seldom uh, symptomatic, and so it's not included on here. Um, but you could also have that on the back of your mind as a differential. Here's a table, I won't get into the full details of it, but you're welcome to refer to it. Um, what it shows is for each of these, um, what the presenting symptom typically is. So for example, with BV, um, there are patients coming in with odor. They complain that there's some fishy gray odor in addition to the discharge. Yeast infections, you'll have complaints about burning or pruritus. Trichomonas sometimes, frankly, is, is very subtle. It could be that there's a little bit of an odor. It could be a little bit of itching. And then for uh, gonorrhea, oftentimes it is asymptomatic, but you do have this mucopurulent discharge as well as a, um, if it ascends, it could result in pelvic pain. And for physiologic discharge, um, that tends to be more clear white. Um, you also see in both um, BV and physiologic discharge, this, um, this word adherent or non-adherent, that just means it's sticking to the side of the vaginal wall. Um, and so I welcome you to refer to this later, but this is a way that you can approach vaginal discharge in terms of looking at the pH, looking at the um, odor with or without KOH, um, and then what you would find on exam. And if you're able to do microscopy, there are microscopic findings for each of these. So you can see for BV, um, you would see clue cells, yeast, I just want to highlight a few, you would see uh, micella and hyphae. And then for trichomonas, if you're lucky, you'll catch some, uh, you'll catch a glimpse at some motile little flagellated organisms swimming around on the uh, wet mount. Um, and for gonococcus, you would see gram negative diplococci, okay? Um, there's also something called the AMSL criteria for BV, which is um, having a pH that's slightly higher than what would be considered normal, so greater than 4.5. You would see clue cells greater than 20% per high-powered high field. And then you would have a positive amine or WIF test, that fishy odor. And that can happen with or without KOH. So if you do have KOH, then it can amplify that. Um, but even without the KOH, sometimes you can have um, a positive finding. And then, um, in addition, this homogenous, thin, milky white discharge is characteristic of BV, okay? So you do an exam and what you find is first and foremost that Sam has a fever. Um, they're uh, 38.4 degrees Celsius. On bimanual exam, you see cervical motion, or you, you find cervical motion tenderness. Um, and you also notice that the uterus is antiverted, 
and there's a little bit of fundal tenderness when you press on the fundus of the uterus, and there's some mild right adnexal tenderness, but the ovaries are non-palpable bilaterally. In addition, on the speculum exam, you don't see any obvious vulvar or vaginal lesions, but you do see that discharge that was being described, and you notice that the uh, cervix is a little friable, and you see the um, IUD string is visible. Um, and that the, the discharge is kind of a greenish mucopurulent uh, quality. So then um, being in an STI clinic, you have immediate access to a microscope as well as urine dip and urine pregnancy tests and rapid HIV tests. So um, you're lucky you're able to do all of these tests point of care. The urine dip is completely negative. The pregnancy test is negative, HIV negative. However, on your wet mount, you do see gram negative diplococci on a gram stain, and you don't see any trichomonas, so no flagellated organisms, no clue cells, no yeast. So this is um, by microscopy, most likely gonorrhea. Um, and the labs that you send out are uh, vaginal GCCT trichomonas and uh, bacterial vaginosis, um, as well as RPR. Okay, so, um, this is a classic case of pelvic inflammatory disease. And pelvic inflammatory disease is in some ways a little bit difficult to talk about because it can be very big and there is a lot of variety in the diagnosis. So acute PID um, can have signs and symptoms that really vary from patient to patient and it's very nonspecific. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we wanted to go over it today is to really highlight the variation of how patients can present and how to really narrow in that diagnosis. Um, when you think about pelvic inflammatory disease, it's exactly what its name suggests. It is an inflammation of the pelvis. So coming back to our anatomy, you can see that it can involve any combination of the upper gynecologic tract, including endometritis, including salpingitis, or a tubo-ovarian abscess, or even peritonitis in the pelvis. Um, the long-term sequelae of PID is, is important. Um, untreated PID can advance and can cause chronic pelvic pain. Adhesions that form as a result of scarring from the inflammation can cause infertility and it can cause pregnancy complications down the road as well. This is a laparoscopic view of a patient who's had PID in the past, oh, excuse me. And you can see that these kind of stretchy looking uh, tissues are examples of adhesions um, on the broad ligament. So when do we treat for PID? Who do we treat for PID? What the CDC recommends is that you want to presumptively treat for PID for people who are younger patients with a gynecologic tract, who are at risk for an STI um, and experiencing pelvic or lower abdominal pain. So all of those have to be present. And either they have no cause for the illness other than PID, so you've ruled out other causes, or they have a physical finding that's either cervical motion tenderness, which our patient Sam had, uterine tenderness, which our patient Sam had, or adnexal tenderness, which our patient had. Um, so, SAM meets criteria for PID. In addition to that, that's kind of your baseline for diagnosing and treating PID. You also can enhance the specificity of that diagnosis with um, any, of these, uh, any of these characteristics. So if there's an oral temperature that's greater than 101 Fahrenheit or 38.3, that increases specificity that this is a, a PID diagnosis. If you have the mucopurulent discharge or cervical friability, if you see white blood cells on saline microscopy, and if you have access to it, if you see um, elevated SED rate or elevated CRP, um, as well as laboratory documentation of cervical gonor gonorrhea or chlamydia, um, all of that increases the specificity of this diagnosis and the appropriateness of treating for it. Now, in terms of which pathogens are implicated, I mentioned gonorrhea and chlamydia, and that is about 50% of PID cases. So um, about 50% are positive for either gonorrhea or chlamydia, but that means that half of them are not positive for gonorrhea or chlamydia and something else is going on. So there are a few other pathogens. You don't need to test for these. Um, you know, like I said, it is not part of the baseline criteria, 
Um, but here are a few other pathogens that are implicated. They can be vaginal flora, including the strict and facultative anaerobes. Um, they can be enteric gram-negative rods like strep agalactiae. And then there's been some speculation and some evidence, although it hasn't been very conclusive, that CMV, T. vaginalis, N. hominis, urea lyticum, as well as MGen, could all play a role in having this pelvic inflammation, um, although there isn't definite evidence that on their own they cause PID. In terms of management, for patients who are diagnosed with PID, you want to offer empiric broad spectrum coverage for the likely pathogens, and that can be either parenteral or it can be intramuscular and oral. Um, for the mild and moderate clinical severity, so I would consider our patient SAM mild and moderate clinical severity. Um, you can do either parenteral or IM. They have similar efficacy. And the one caveat to that is that when you look at parenteral or IV versus IM and oral regimens, um, there aren't really studies that demonstrate with endometrium sampling or fallopian tube evidence that it eradicates the infections one better than the other in those sites. Um, and there also are not studies looking at the long-term complications like infertility and ectopic pregnancy um, after IM oral versus parenteral. So that's the one caveat, but overall it seems that these two options are um, equally efficacious. For the parenteral options, you basically want to do a cephalosporin um, IV, and you can either do ceftriaxone, cefotetin, or cefoxetin IV, and um, that can be every 24 hours, 12 hours, or six hours, respectively. And with that cephalosporin, you add doxycycline, 100 milligrams, and that can be either PO or IV every 12 hours. As, and then if you're doing the ceftriaxone option, you add metronidazole to that as well. And the metronidazole dose is 500 milligrams orally or IV every 12 hours. Um, so doxycycline, cephalosporin, and you can pick between those three. And then if you pick ceftriaxone IV, then you add um, metronidazole. If you wanna go with the oral or IM, oral and intramuscular treatment options, again, you wanna pick a cephalosporin. So the options are ceftriaxone 500 milligrams IM in a single dose, which would provide coverage for gonorrhea as well. Um, or you can do cefoxetin um, plus probenicid, or you can do a parenteral third generation cephalosporin, which we talked about in the last slide. Um, and no matter which cephalosporin you pick, you will add both doxycycline and metronidazole for 14 days. And um, the doxycycline and metronidazole is BID. So you need to counsel your patients once in the morning, once in the nighttime for two weeks, okay? Twice a day for two weeks. So for Sam, you pick ceftriaxone, 500 milligrams IM in a single dose, as well as doxycycline and metronidazole for two weeks. Um, and in terms of Sam's IUD, um, this is something that comes up a lot. Do we need to take the IUD out? Do IUDs have any, um, any risks with regard to long-term infertility in the setting of PID? And um, is the IUD causing the PID? Uh, what the CDC says is that the risk for PID that's associated with IUD use typically happens within the first three weeks after insertion. So we know that Sam has had their IUD for years. Um, it was inserted in 2016. So that isn't the case for this situation. Um, and so we do not need to remove the IUD. That said, if Sam does not feel better within two to three days or 48 to 72 hours, then you can consider removing the IUD. So you might want to counsel Sam about that. Okay. All right. So here are several references related to PID. Um, and with that, it is my great pleasure to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Vadia, who will tell us about Sam's partner, Max, and why Max is in clinic. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I am looking forward to talking about Max and his symptoms. So next slide, please. All right. So we'll start with Max's sexual history. So next slide. 
Max is a 37-year-old cis male who has sex with persons of all genders. He was diagnosed with HIV in 2010, and he's on ART, and his HIV is pretty well controlled. In the last six months, he tells you that apart from Sam, he has also had two cis male partners, and he has both receptive anal intercourse and insertive anal intercourse. He also tells you that he uses condoms intermittently. He's had a few STIs in the past. He tells you that he had a perianal outbreak of HSC2 once, and he used to take acyclovir PRN. He last used it about four years ago. He's also had gonorrhea and chlamydia in the past, which are both treated. Next slide, please. And he tells you that with his PCP, he gets tested for STIs every six months, and his last test was five months ago, and his RPR and three-site gonorrhea chlamydia testing were all negative. Next slide. So today he tells you that for about five days, he's noticed some urethral discharge. He thinks it looks a little mucousy, and he also says that he's having some burning and pain when he urinates. Next slide, please. So you examine him and he has some discharge on his underwear and you notice some cloudy penile discharge. And along with that, he's got some right-sided testicular tenderness. Thanks. So for this part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, male genital tract infections. We'll first start off with urethritis, just inflammation of the urethra, and then we'll talk about epididymitis. Next slide, please. So for urethritis, most patients, more than 50% are going to present with dysuria. Other things that you can gather from their history are urethral discharge, and this can range from purulent discharge. They'll also tell you that, you know, there's just some discomfort around their urethra um, and maybe some itching around their urethral meatus. And of note, asymptomatic infection can also occur. On exam, um, you might see some erythema of the penile tip or the urethral meatus. You could see urethral discharge. And in some cases, you might see inguinal lymphadenopathy. But note that in some cases, you might not see any findings on exam. And we'll talk a little later about what to do in those cases. Next slide, please. So let's talk about pathogens that cause urethritis. So urethritis is usually divided into gonococcal urethritis, which is caused by Neisseria gonorrhea, and then non-gonococcal urethritis, or NGU, which could be caused by a variety of other pathogens. NGU is commonly caused by chlamydia. So 15 to 40% of NGU cases will be caused by chlamydia trachomatis. Um, but other organisms, notably uh, mycoplasma genitalium, um, can cause NGU as well. And MGen is seen in about 15 to 25% of cases. Trick can cause urethritis, usually in men um, who are sexually active with female partners. And then these others that I've listed are a lot more rare, but just interesting to think about. So Neisseria meningitidis, you can see that, and it's usually transmitted in an oral penile, penile route. And usually in these cases, you know, if you look at it under the microscope, you might see these gram-negative diplococci, but you test them for gonorrhea PCR and it's negative. So you're like, what's happening here? So in those cases, um, you can send the sample for, for culture and it might be Neisseria meningitidis. Other rare causes, HSV can cause urethritis, and you could have HSV urethritis with or without classic HSV ulcers. EBV and adenovirus are rare causes of urethritis. And lastly, enteric bacteria, um, especially in those with insertive anal intercourse, can also cause urethritis. Next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about diagnostic criteria for urethritis. Um, any of the below, which I'm going to talk about, if you have even one of them, um, you meet diagnostic criteria for urethritis. So next slide, please. The first one is discharge. So if you see any urethral discharge, and this could be you know, clear discharge or purulent discharge, if you see any discharge, then that meets the criteria for urethritis. Next slide, please. If you have gram stain capabilities, so if you're in an STD clinic, which you, know, you can do a gram stain, look at it under the microscope, then you can look for um, gonococcal infections. So if you see these white blood cells with intracellular gram negative diplococci, as is shown in this picture, then you have presumed gonococcal infection. If you don't see these gram-negative diplococci in your white blood cells, but you just see a lot of white blood cells, that could also meet the criteria for urethritis. Next slide, please. The third kind of criteria um, is that if you spin the urine and you look at it under the microscope, and if you see a lot of white blood cells, so 10 or more white blood cells per high power field, that would meet the urethritis criteria. And next slide, please. And lastly, if you have capability to do a urine dipstick and you see a positive leukocyte esterase on first void urine, then that also meets the criteria. So again, you don't need all four of these, you just need one. So any one of these, you meet the criteria for urethritis. 
Next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about a treatment algorithm for your arthritis diagnosis. I realize that many clinics will not have point of care testing available. So we are going to talk about what to do if you have point of care testing available and what to do if you don't have it available. So next slide. So if you're a clinic where you can do gram stain of a discharge, then you should look at it under the microscope. If you see intracellular gram negative diplococci, that's um, probable gonococcal infection. So in that case, you treat the patient for gonococcal infection, and you also send a urine sample for a NAT for gonorrhea and chlamydia. If you look under the microscope and you don't see those intracellular diplococci, but you see a lot of whites, so two or more whites per high power field in an area with a lot of STIs, that's kind of the diagnostic criteria. And if you see that, then you should manage as NGU. And that's because you didn't see an ev evidence of gonorrhea, so you can just manage as non-gonococcal urethritis. You should still send um, a urine NAT for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Next slide. So if you're in a place that doesn't have gram stain capabilities, but you have urine microscopy available and urine dipsticks, you could start off with just a urine dipstick on first void urine. And if that's positive, you're done then you just treat for both gonorrhea and chlamydia, because in this case, you haven't ruled out gonorrhea, and you should still send the urine for a NAT for gonorrhea or chlamydia. If um, the leukocyte esterase is negative, then you can proceed to kind of spin the urine and look at the sediment under the microscope, and then again, your criteria is 10 or more whites. Next slide. And now the common scenario in most clinics where you don't have these point of care tests available, in that case, you look to see if there's any discharge. If there's urethral discharge, then you should, yeah, and you should send a urine NAT for gonorrhea and chlamydia testing. If there's no discharge, just remember back to the diagnostic criteria, then in this case, this person doesn't really meet diagnostic criteria. So in that case, you test them, send a NAT for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and then you wait for the results to treat them. Next slide. All right, so you might have noticed that the diagnostic algorithm didn't talk about M. genitalium. So I did wanna briefly just talk about this organism because we are seeing more of it. So there's one study, which was a prospective study, which included a little more than 1500 male participants. And they saw that the risk of M. genitalium in those who had urogenital symptoms compared to those who were asymptomatic was higher. So the odds ratio was 1.4. And then when they looked at those who were diagnosed with urethritis, that was significantly associated with M. genitalium infection as well. So the odds ratio was close to three in that case. Um, so with that study, you know, the authors were saying that perhaps we should be testing symptomatic males for um, M. genitalium. But, you know, I think we're still learning a lot about this. What our STI guidelines do say is that if somebody has been treated for NGU, but has persistent or recurrent symptoms despite treatment, then you should definitely test for M. genitalium. Local guidance might be different about this, but these are kind of our national STI guidelines. So I think, you know, where we are right now, definitely think about this in someone who's not getting better and has persistent or recurrent symptoms. Next slide, please. All right, so talking about treatment, so for gonococcal urethritis, the treatment is ceftriaxone 500 IM times one. If you're treating for both gonorrhea and chlamydia, ceftriaxone, again, IM, but you also give doxycycline 100 milligrams BID for seven days. Then if you're treating for NGU, you just give the doxycycline 100 milligrams BID for seven days. And then if you're treating for M. genitalium, so if, if you have a positive test for M. genitalium, you think that's what's driving the symptoms. Then in that case, you know, the treatment is doxycycline for seven days, followed by moxifloxacin for seven days. Next slide, please. All right, so moving along, I just wanted to talk about epididymitis. Um, you can kind of think about this like the PID of the male genital tract. Next slide, please. So what are you gonna um, see in epididymitis? So the history really, um, patients will tell you they have unilateral testicular pain. And on exam, you could see tenderness of the unilateral testes, you could see a hydrocele, and then sometimes you can actually feel a swollen epididymis. Uh, you can also feel a swollen spermatic cord that can also be pretty tender. Next slide. One thing you really don't want to miss when you're thinking about epididymitis is testicular torsion. So this is a surgical emergency. And you're mostly going to see that in younger patients. So adolescents are people who you're going to see this with, and it usually presents a severe, sudden unilateral pain. On exam, you could see a high writing testes on one side, 
and the epididymis could be located a little bit more anteriorly. And an important test to do for this is the cremasteric reflex. I had to remind myself what this was. So essentially, you're stroking the inner side of the thigh, and the testes on the same side will rise up into the inguinal canal when you do that, just rise up a little bit towards the inguinal canal. And this actually has a pretty high odds ratio associated with testicular torsion if you don't have that reflex. So just, you know, something to think about when you're evaluating these patients. And lastly, if you suspect epididymitis, but you test them for urethritis and they don't have any signs of inflammation, then you should, again, think about possibly testicular torsion. Next slide, please. So let's talk about pathogens that are implicated in epididymitis. So for sexually transmitted, you have your usual players, so gonorrhea, chlamydia. The other thing that you should think about with epididymitis, um, especially in those uh, who have insertive anal sex, is enteric organisms, so things like E. coli. And then there's also non-sexually transmitted epididymitis, and you're usually going to see this in older patients who might have bladder outlet obstructions, so think BPH. And in these cases, they have you know, bacteria, and then they develop epididymitis, like an ascending infection because of obstruction. Another interesting thing to think about, which is rare, but if somebody's been having symptoms for a long time, so six or more weeks, Think about more rare pathogens. So if somebody has risk factors for TB, TB can actually cause something called granulomatous epididymitis. So again, very rare, but just something to think about if someone's having symptoms for a long time. Next slide. So I think I just wanted to briefly touch base on MGen again here. So the guidelines state that, you know, we don't have great data about MGen and epididymitis. There was this one small study, just 50 acute epididymitis and which organisms were implicated. So in those who didn't have gonorrhea or chlamydia, MGen was detected in one man. So very rare and not something we commonly think about with epididymitis, although it can occur. Next slide, please. So how do you diagnose epididymitis? So with the clinical diagnosis, you're going to do your general testing for urethritis like we talked about. So send the urine, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and NAT, look at it under the microscope, um, and you should also, along with that, send urine bacterial cultures. But, you know, overall, it's going to be a clinical diagnosis. Next slide, please. Um, so you might be thinking, what about ultrasound? So you, this should definitely um, be done if you're thinking about testicular torsion. And in that case, it should be done on an emergency basis. But if you're not thinking about testicular torsion, you don't need to get this because actually, a negative ultrasound doesn't rule out epididymitis. So if you have a high clinical suspicion, you should just treat for epididymitis. Next slide, please. So that brings me to treatment. So it really depends on what organisms you're thinking of. So if you think that the most likely cause is chlamydia or gonorrhea, then your treatment's going to be IM ceftriaxone plus doxycycline 100 milligrams PO BID, one thing to note is that the doxy treatment duration for epididymitis is longer than that for urethritis. So it's 10 days for epididymitis, whereas it was seven days for urethritis. Then if you're thinking that chlamydia, gonorrhea, or enteric organisms may be involved, the treatment is different. So you should think about this reg regimen, especially in men who practice insertive anal sex. So in this case, you should treat with ceftriaxone and levofloxacin. And the levofloxacin will cover chlamydia and then also enteric pathogens. And then lastly, if you're suspecting that epididymitis most likely due to enteric organisms, so this could most likely be in um, somebody who's had a recent neurological procedure, which may have caused some sort of translocation in that area, then in that case, you could just treat with levofloxacin. Next slide, please. All right, so one thing to think about um, is whether Max's HIV infection matters. So really the treatment and the diagnosis does not change um, in those who have HIV versus those who don't. Sometimes in those who have HIV, especially those who might be more immune compromised, you might think about more rare pathogens, which I've listed here, but that's really not that frequent and overall management should be the same. Next slide, please. So back to the case, let's talk about what ended up happening with Max. So you did have Ramstein capabilities and you looked at his discharge under the microscope. There were a lot of whites and there were also these intracellular gram negative diplococci. And then you did send out RPR and also three site gonorrhea chlamydia testing. For treatment, because he did have unilateral testicular tenderness, you decided to treat with ceftriaxone and also levofloxacin. 
And the legal flux is in is because if you remember when I started talking about his case, he does um, have in insertive anal sex. So he is at risk for enteric organisms for epididymitis. Ultimately, his test results come back and his urine NAT is positive for gonorrhea. His RPR is negative. Next slide, please. And I did want to briefly touch base on partner management. So this um, is for Max and Sam's partners, and they have the same guidance. So refer all sex partners during the past 60 days before symptom onset for testing and presumptive treatment. And if you think that there are some partners who might not be able to you know, be linked to care, you could consider expedited partner therapy, where the patient is given some treatment to take home to their partners. Um, and then also patients and partners should be instructed to abstain from sexual intercourse until patients and partners have all been treated um, and have also had resolution of all their symptoms. So I will end there and pass it over to Dr. Tang for the last case. Thank you, Dr. Ovidia. Um, so uh, the story continues now with patient Tom. Um, he comes into the clinic because he says that he had sexual contact with the previous patient, Max, who was diagnosed with gonorrhea. And Max had told him to go to the clinic because he needs to get tested and treated for uh, gonorrhea. Um, he reports, uh, Tom reports having receptive anal intercourse about two weeks ago with Max, and now he is having anal rectal pain. Next slide. So um, uh, you find a little bit more about Tom when he comes in. He's a 23-year-old man who has sex with men. Um, in the last three months, he has two male partners, including Max, um, and reports receptive anal intercourse with intermittent condom use. Also has receptive oral penile sex, um, but um, denies oral anal sex. Um, he, in terms of his STI history, he has no history of HIV herpes or gonorrhea and chlamydia. However, he did have secondary syphilis uh, once in January of this year with an RPR of 1 to 128, and he had presented with a uh, palmar plantar rash. He was treated appropriately with benzathine, penicillin G, and um, was tested for HIV at that time as well and was negative. He had a follow-up RPR um, for his syphilis, which uh, appropriately uh, uh, titrated down to uh, a 1 to 4. And uh, he noted that he received his first uh, monkeypox or mpox vaccine 30 days ago. Next slide. So um, in terms of his symptoms, um, he, he reports anal rectal pain for the past three days. It's associated with rectal uh, discharge that's bloody and also tenesmus or a feeling of um, incomplete defecation. Um, he reports no diarrhea or abdominal cramping and also denies any pharyngeal or general symptoms. Next slide. So on exam, uh, you uh, do an external rectal exam. You don't notice any ulcers, lesions, or rash. Uh, you then perform a digital rectal exam um, and note diffuse tenderness. And then endoscopy, which, um, you which is recommended for any patient with rectal pain, bleeding, or um, or discharge, um, you know that it's inflamed, you see friable mucosa uh, with discharge, but no ulcers, as you can see in the image on the right. Next slide. So uh, this is, the clinical picture is likely leading you to a proctitis, uh, which is uh, inflammation of the rectum and uh, presents with rectal pain, bleeding, um, and or, or discharge, often associated with that feeling of urgency to defecate. Um, Proctitis should be distinguished from other uh, uh, sexually transmitted gastrointestinal syndromes such as proctocolitis and enteritis. So with proctocolitis, um, it's associated with the same symptoms of proctitis, but you also have symptoms of diarrhea and abdominal cramps, um, as this is caused by inflammation of the colonic mucosa. And then enteritis or inflammation of the small intestines usually results with diarrhea um, and abdominal cramping, but without signs of proctitis. Uh, given that there, our patient Tom presented with the acute onset of rectal pain, rectal discharge, and tenesmus, um, without the diarrhea and abdominal symptoms, the clinical symptom is, is most, co most consistent with proctitis. Next slide. So sexually transmitted proctitis can occur in anyone who reports receptive anal sex, although it's most common in men who have sex with men. Proctocolitis and enteritis can also be sexually acquired, uh, particularly among men who have sex with men who perform oral anal sex, also known as analingus and, and commonly referred to as rimming. It's also important to distinguish between these three syndromes because the differential diagnosis and causative pathogens can differ. 
So proctitis occurs predominantly um, among people who have receptive anal exposures uh, with gonorrhea, chlamydia, including LGV cerebars, herpes, uh, and syphilis being the most common sexually transmitted um, uh, infections. Although, of course, now uh, with the recent MPOX outbreak occurring in the US, um, MPOX is definitely something you want to consider as well. Uh, Mycoplasma genitae also has been detected in certain cases of, of proctitis and even Neisseria meningitis, um, but these are, are, are less common. In terms of proctocolitis, um, this can be acquired either through receptive, receptive anal intercourse or through oral anal, anal contact, depending on the pathogen. Um, it can be caused by uh, Campylobacter, Shigella, Antimoeba solitica, um, LGV, or, or syphilis as well. And then with enteritis, it's often caused by oral anal contact, um, including uh, sexual practices that can facilitate transmission of enteric pathogens, such as Giardia, which is the most frequently implicated parasitic infection, as well as um, bacterial infections like Shigella, Salmonella, E. coli, and Campylobacter. Um, and outbreaks of these infections have been reported among um, men who have sex with men, and definitely um, something you should uh, consider and, and test for. Um, and when thinking about enteritis, um, also uh, CMV is something to consider in immunocompromised uh, persons with HIV, as well as other opportunistic uh, infections. Uh, next slide. So one of the uh, infections I wanted to highlight was LGV, or um, also known as lymphogranuloma venerium. So uh, LGV um, is uh, caused by uh, particular serovars of chlamydia, uh, specifically L1, L2, and L3. And um, historically, it had been only seen in kind of in the tropical and subtropical areas of the world, but um, over the past decade or so, it's been increasingly seen as a cause of proctitis and proctocolitis among uh, uh, men who have. Um, it initially, uh, in terms of the primary stage of infection, is generally a small uh, painless ulcer. It's often unnoticed and, um, and missed um, and, and resolves on its own without treatment. And it's really the secondary stage of infection where uh, patients may uh, present um, to uh, the clinic. So um, there's kind of two syndromes. There's the inguinal syndrome, which is less common in the, the US at least, and um, uh, can uh, be, uh, it's, it's, it's an image that you see on the top right, but um, present, can present with kind of inflammatory uh, reaction of lymph nodes. Um, and uh, you can see it, it can be both of superficial and deep inguinal nodes um, leading to uh, this groove sign that you can see in the image um, forming buboes, which can be quite painful. Um, but uh, kind of what, what's more commonly seen and relevant to this uh, talk is the anal rectal syndrome where a patient can present with a rectal discharge that may be bloody, anal pain, constipation, uh, fever, and or tenesmus. Next slide. So um, the other uh, infection I wanted to highlight was um, monkeypox or mpox. Um, and in this current outbreak that we are going through right now, and the uh, um, there's been a uh, it's notable that uh, many patients uh, have been presenting with isolated anogenital lesions um, and, and, and proctitis, and, and quite severe proctitis um, that can be uh, quite painful. So some images uh, you see on the slide here are, are those of people with confirmed monkeypox uh, virus, viral infection. And um, with many of these, you can see uh, kind of the classic umbilicated uh, perianal lesions, although these lesions uh, may uh, look more, more atypical depending on um, the stage or, uh, of infection or uh, as these lesions do evolve over time. Um, currently, uh, the commercially available tests that are available are only validated um, for swabbing lesions themselves, um, although there's more research and work being done on potential people uh, without lesions present or even on asymptomatic patients. And um, one thing to, important to note is that um, many, many studies, um, case series of, of MPOX of, in this current outbreak have noted that there's a high uh, co-infection with HIV and other STIs. So even if you suspect MPOX um, or have these plastic lesions, it's important to test for other STIs, including HIV, and um, there may be co-infection, um, like I said, which is quite common, at least in this current outbreak. Next slide.
So in terms of the management and, and, and diagnosis of testing, um, it's important to get gonorrhea and chlamydia testing. Um, uh, most important to get NAT. Um, if you are a place that is able to do uh, gonorrhea culture or gram stain of the rectal discharge, um, you can do that. And then um, uh, if you do have LGV PCR available, you can also get that as well, although that's quite rare and there's no um, commercially available assays, but uh, some labs have validated that test um, and may be useful if you can get those results in time um, to impact um, clinical management. It's also important to get syphilis testing, so def definitely a serologic testing, um, but if you have dark field microscopy available, um, you can also uh, do a dark field of the lesion. And then herpes is also something important to get as well, preferably PCR over culture and um, I'm doing that of the rectal lesions. And then of course now MPOX um, is important to test for as well and swapping lesions if those are present. Um, if, uh, you know, in terms of other testing, you can consider testing for mycoplasma genitalium with the NAT. Um, if symptoms are, do persist after receiving standard treatment, which I'll go into the next slide. Um, and also particularly if, if this workup is negative and it seems like this is really a, a, an STI, um, you know, M genitalium testing uh, with a rectal swab could be done. Although with this test as well, it's not widely available. Um, and I know places uh, that do currently have that available include uh, San Francisco Public Health Lab. Um, and then um, while maybe not uh, actually causing the proctitis itself, um, it's important to test for HIV and also gonorrhea and chlamydia at other exposed sites like the pharynx or um, urine testing um, for patients with acute proctitis because um, of co-infection uh, with HIV um, is common with proctitis and also uh, it's possible that they may, uh, the person may have gonorrhea and chlamydia at other sites, uh, at other exposed sites. Next slide. So in terms of treatment, so it's important to, um, uh, you know, whenever you diagnose acute proctitis to presumptively empirically treat uh, with this regimen on the slide. Um, so uh, you would want to treat with ceftriaxone 500 milligrams IM in a single dose, um, or if the person weighs greater than 150 kilograms, uh, you would want to do a, a higher dose of one gram of ceftriaxone and also treat with doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days to cover for chlamydia. Um, so in the case for Tom, he you know, would have already been treated for uh, um, gonorrhea with ceftrax, and regardless of if his symptoms, because he was a sexual contact uh, to someone with gonorrhea, but you should also treat him with uh, doxycycline in this case to, um, in case he has concurrent chlamydia infection. Um, one thing to note is that um, if, uh, the, if, you know, in this case where he, he did have symptoms of LGV or, you know, his presence of, you know, bloody discharge, uh, perianal and mucosal ulcers, which is head does miss, um, and the, the rectal chlamydia test comes back positive, you would want to treat for LGV, and a treatment for LGV requires three weeks of treatment uh, per the CDC uh, guidelines, and so you'd want to extend that treatment uh, for 21 days of, of the, of, with the doxycycline. And then uh, kind of lastly, um, if there are uh, painful perianal or mucosal ulcers present, you could also add on treatment for general herpes. Next slide. So you end up treating uh, Max, I'm sorry, you end up treating Tom with uh, ceftriaxone and doxy, and then his test results come back. He has a positive uh, rectal swab for gonorrhea. Um, the rest of his, uh, STG testing um, come back negative, including HIV. Uh, next slide. And, um, you know, while in this case we were able to diagnose him with um, gonococcal proctitis, um, it's also important to just consider other causes of anorectal symptoms, actually uh, non infectious causes. Um, so there's, you know, common, more common middle. Uh, causes like hemorrhoids or anal fissures and, and benign ones like pruritus ani, but um, you also uh, want to consider things like perianal abscess or, or fistulas, um, and particularly um, inflammatory bowel disease is, is important. There's a lot of uh, misdiagnosis um, with uh, inflammatory bowel disease um, um, for people when, when things like LGV or other uh, STIs are not considered, um, and also vice versa that um, it's 
you know, you may be thinking an SCI, but it's also possible if, that someone may have inflammatory bowel disease um, and uh, keeping that near differential, especially if symptoms aren't getting better and uh, the workup is negative. And then um, certainly malignancy is also something that you wanna consider as, as well, um, since that can have quite high morbidity. And um, again, if, if symptoms are persistent, despite treatments for infectious causes and, um, um, and uh, you know, the workup is negative, um, you may want to uh, refer the patient over to a um, uh, gastroenterologist or a rectal surgeon. Uh, next slide. So in terms of additional management for acute proctitis, I wanted to bring up a couple more things. So, you know, our patient, Tom, he had, uh, had secondary syphilis earlier this year. He now um, was diagnosed with rectal gonorrhea and um, he's at quite high risk for HIV uh, and uh, which uh, there's been, you know, quite a, um, there's been some evidence that anyone with a rectal SCI, particularly gonorrhea and syphilis, are at higher risk of, of HIV in the future. And um, so you really want someone like this um, to be on HIV prep, and, and currently uh, Tom isn't on that. And the reason is uh, because HIV prep is, is very effective when taken as prescribed, um, and greater than 99% effective. And currently there's many different options for uh, patients uh, like Tom. There's a daily oral medication that can be taken with TDF-FTC or uh, brand, with the brand name Truvada or TAFN-FTC or brand name Discovy. Um, if you know, someone doesn't want to take a daily medication and can predict their, uh, when they are going to have sex, um, you can also do you know, on-demand uh, oral medications such as using a PrEP 211 regimen, which is, um, an option for MSM, and there's um, some studies that are showing that are really great evidence uh, for that regimen and being protective for HIV. And then um, excitingly, uh, there's a also injectable PrEP as well, which um, can be taken every two months for people who uh, may have difficulty in adhering to a daily oral medication or, or PrEP 211. Also important, in, you know, with MPOX outbreak, it's important to offer the MPOX vaccine to, to um, you know, MSM and particularly those with uh, an STI, uh, if if you know you don't think that the that you're low, you have pretty low suspicion that they currently have MPOX or um, or you know were not diagnosed with MPOX before, as uh, it's it's there's uh, been some good studies as well looking at um, you know history of a STI being predictive of of uh, risk for MPOX. So making sure that they have that the vaccine to prevent that infection in the future. And he, if you remember correctly uh, from before, he received his MPOX vaccine 30 days ago. So uh, it was now due for his second dose, which should be given uh, 20 days after the, the initial dose. Next slide. So lastly, I just wanted to bring up the study, the DoxyPEP study, which was presented uh, at age 2022. Um, this is a, a new exciting intervention um, that uh, someone like Tom may benefit from in order to prevent uh, bacterial SIs in the future. So in this study, uh, it was a randomized open label trial among men who have sex with men and transgender women living with HIV um, or who are on HIV prep who had gonorrhea, chlamydia, or early syphilis in the past year. And they were randomized to two to one to either uh, 200 milligrams of doxycycline taken, ideally within 24 hours, but within 72 hours of condomless sex or no doxycycline. And um, each of these groups were tested for STIs and enrollment quarterly and when symptomatic. And the primary endpoint was at least one incident STI, uh, specifically gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis during quarterly follow-up. Next slide. So um, the results were so compelling that uh, the, data, the Data Safety and Monitoring Board recommended stopping of the control arm due to significant effectiveness in both the, uh, both the um, uh, cohort of HIV, uh, uh, people living with HIV and people on PrEP. Um, they found that uh, there was a quarterly SDA reduction of 62% in uh, people living with HIV and 66% in those taking PrEP. And there was a substantial reduction of incidence in each of the different bacterial STIs, including gonorrhea. Um, the participants found that the doxy was uh, well tolerated and they reported high self-reported adherence. So this is really exciting 
um, because it has it, it, this demonstrates that doxypep has the potential for an effective to be an effective preventer strategy in populations with high STI incidence. Um, however, there are some things that are uh, uh, that are kind of unknown and to be determined, including uh, if you know wider use of doxypep and, and how that might impact tetracycline resistance development in gonorrhea and other STIs, as well as non um, um, uh, STIs such as Staph aureus, uh, commensal neisseria, and the gut microbiome. And um, you know, how well does someone actually need to be taking doxypep to be protected against these bacterial STIs and the potential for changes um, in sexual behavior? And then um, next slide, my last slide. Um, so the CDC updated their online STI treatment guidelines um, to provide consideration for the use of doxypep in um, light of the, the release of these, or in response um, to the release of these results of the doxypep study, acknowledging that there are individuals and clinicians who are already engaging in the off label use of doxycycline as a uh, bacterial STI uh, PEP. Or, or, um, and so these are some things that are important to note. So currently the data really only applies to men who have sex with men and transgender women, although there are studies that are currently ongoing among heter heterosexual cisgender women and hoping for those results to come out by next year. Doxycycline 200 milligrams administered ideally within 24 hours with up to 72 hours of condylist sex is the regimen and um, really shouldn't be using any other antibiotics. At this at uh, this time, when you know counseling or prescribing uh, doxypep, providers should counsel patients about the benefits, um, but also the potential adverse side effects of doxycycline, including photosensitivity and uh, GI symptoms, as well as uh, kind of rarely esophageal ulceration. Although that can um, be prevented by uh, drinking a you know, full glass of water with the doxycycline and um, and not and preventing you know not not laying down right after. Uh, taking the medication, and um, also providers should still continue to screen and test for bacterial STIs, even for people who may be using doxycycline as other pepper prep. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, there. And yeah, so also just wanted to say that um, we, you know, this story uh, will be continued and stay tuned for our syndromic management of sexual age which uh, we will likely have by the end of the calendar year. So um, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Johnson next to moderate our Q&A session. Awesome. Thank you so much to all of you for this excellent presentation. I know that I learned a lot and I hope you all did too in the audience. We have had great audience participation and I have a lot of questions for you all to answer. I've been answering some of them, but I still have some that I'm going to pass off to you guys for your thoughts as well. So I'll just start at the top. Okay, first question. Um, this came up during Dr. Palatsker's presentation. It says, I know the CDC guidelines recommend not testing for mycoplasma genitalium with an initial diagnosis. Um, I believe this would have been talking about cervicitis, um, but realistically and logistically, wouldn't it be easier to test for MGen when a patient is presenting with something like cervicitis or even PID? Thoughts? You could. <laughs> um, you know, there's not, there isn't real harm in doing it. It's, um, it's more, oh, and good. We have some CME requirements up as well. Um, yeah, so you know, it, it, that's one of those things that the clinical judgment, and I think that it's also worth saying, and I, I think this is something that we, the four of us, talk about a lot, is that with the CDC treatment guidance, it is guidance, but it is not the law. It's not written in stone. It's not something that you have to always follow all the time if you have clinical reasons why you would do something differently. Um, you know, so with that said, you could do it. I don't think that there's a big harm in it. The question is, is there really a benefit to doing that? And, um, you know, at, the, at that point, if you decide to do it, it would be a clinical judgment call. It wouldn't be like, this is what the CDC is recommending. Um, and so, you know, I think that's really what you would have to think about. So yeah, if you think that this is someone who uh, logistically would benefit from doing that, you know, you could. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that's a great answer. I agree. It's not what the guidelines say, but I will say 
some clinics uh, more on the urethritis side, I think of it, um, but some clinics are just testing for MGen at the same time they're testing for chlamydia and gonorrhea. So it's something to think about. I think the PID MGen connection is there's some conflicting data there. So that piece um, is probably an area that still warrants some further study. Mm -hmm. really yeah, exactly. Okay, I have another question about PID in the chat. Ooh, yes. <laughs> okay. If someone receives a diagnosis of PID in the first three weeks after an IUD is inserted, then yeah. does it need to be removed? You know, I have to, Dr. Johnson, I have a confession that I saw that question um, shortly after I finished my talk. And I actually, you know, was looking for an answer, and there isn't a good answer for that. Um, but I think that ultimately, you know, when you're thinking about PID and um, IUD insertion, like I said in my presentation, PID is really this kind of like vague spectrum of inflammation. Um, and the articles that I found related to PID shortly after IUD insertion um, were looking at things like, did this person have, uh, have a cervical infection prior to IUD insertion? And then when the IUD was inserted, did that introduce the bacteria into the uterine cavity and that's what caused the IUD, you know, so there's, there's questions about that. Um, and I think that ultimately when you're, when you're dealing with that situation, you want to think about, first of all, how important is this IUD to the patient? And um, is this a situation where someone had their IUD put in and um, they don't have a lot of access to IUDs and contraception is incredibly important to them and removing it, what would the consequence of that be versus the consequence of just treating, following them closely and leaving the IUD and then seeing if it gets better, you know, because that's really the question is if you take the IUD out, is it more likely for the infection to clear versus leaving the IUD in? Um, and there's really not a lot of research about it. Um, so I would say that, again, this is one of these clinical calls that you have to make, and there aren't very good guidelines out there, and there's very little evidence on what to do one way or the other. If it's, if it's really going to be difficult to have the patient come back to have the IUD reinserted and there's limited access to contraception, um, I don't think it would be unreasonable to leave the IUD in, treat the patient, bring them back soon to make sure that their symptoms resolve. Um, but if this easy enough to take the IUD out and bring them back in a couple weeks after the infection is cleared and then have a new IUD, that's also a valid way to proceed. So, you know, again, not inconclusive and, and depends. It depends. Thanks. I have nothing to add to that answer. It seems <laughs> a bit of a gray area. <laughs> yeah, it's really gray. Okay, the next question came in during Dr. Vaidya's section of this talk, but I will turn it over to anyone because I think this actually probably comes more down to just clinical gestalt than anything else, but this is about mycoplasma genitalium. Let's say a person starts a course of doxycycline, say for something like non-gonococcal urethritis, they go home, their test result later comes back for mycoplasma genitalium, say from a urogenital site, and some time has passed since they completed their doxycycline course. Do you restart the doxycycline before a week of moxifloxacin, or can you just go straight to moxifloxacin? What do you think? This is a really good question, and I will kind of comment on it, but I would be curious to hear everybody else's thoughts as well. Um, so the reason, you know, that you want to do doxycycline first followed by moxifloxacin is you want to reduce the bacterial burden of MGen with the doxycycline. And that is kind of protecting your moxifloxacin from developing resistance. So that's why the regimen is designed the way it is. Um, you know, I, I think if somebody is presenting much later after they finish their doxy course, I think that makes it a little easier because you don't want to breed resistance. So potentially you could restart. But what if they're coming in like a few days after, like one or two days? Um, there's really nothing in the guidelines. I saw this question in the chat too. So I looked at the guidelines, you know, and they don't say anything about what to do with short treatment interruptions. I think this again comes down to clinical gestalt. Like you kind of make a judgment about, you know, how many days has it been? How comfortable do you feel? The risk is always breeding moxifloxacin resistance. So that is the risk with kind of 
you know, if you have a higher bacterial burden with days past from your doxy treatment, that is the risk you're facing. Um, so yeah, I think for me, I would kind of look at the time that's passed. If it's a lot of time, I would restart. But if not, you could consider kind of taking that risk. But I'm curious to hear what others on the panel think as well. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in on this question because it's an excellent question that has come up a lot. Um, and we've actually spoken to some of the national experts on MGen about this. Um, and as uh, Dr. Vita mentioned, it, the point of the doxy is to reduce uh, you know, organismal load of, of the MGen before starting the moxifloxacin. Um, some of the thoughts from the experts were that uh, MGen is actually a very slow growing organism. So it's probably okay if there is a gap, um, although there's no you know, clear guidance in terms of how long um, you should, you know, before you might want to restart treatment with uh, doxy first. Um, but general, you know, they were saying, you know, one to two weeks um, is probably acceptable um, for not doing the doxy pretreatment, um, given how slow growing the organism is. But I think a lot of it is just a little bit in terms of um, you know, discussion with the, the patient and, um, you know, obviously not wanting to develop uh, moxifloxin resistance, but at least the experts that we, we spoke to uh, did give kind of the guidelines of one to two weeks, which is something I've uh, shared with other people when, when they have this question, when this situation comes up. Yeah, thank you guys. I think I think along the same lines for me, like maybe if it's been a week, I would allow that and then I think about it. But obviously, if the experts are saying one to two weeks, then go out to two weeks, perhaps. Um, but I, again, this I agree with what Dr. Vidia said. This is not something that's covered in the STI treatment guidelines specifically. Dr. Tang, since you have the floor, the next question also to you. I heard the state lab is trying to validate MPOX PCR for rectal and pharyngeal sites with no lesions aka asymptomatic people. Do you know the status of this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I um, I know that it's not just our state lab and I believe folks at the CDC and other places are also trying to validate this. Um, at this time, um, you know, we are not uh, able to, to, to offer this testing, at least for clinical purposes. And um, I, I don't quite know exactly where the status is on that, but I can certainly follow up. Um, with our state lab on that question. Sounds good, thank you. All right, next question is for the floor and it's a little bit of a longer one. Okay, can any of you comment on patients who are not treated for gonorrhea or chlamydia and subsequently have self-resolution of these infections, understanding there may be long-term complications like infertility in persons with a uterus? So this comes up in sexual assault evaluations, particularly in minors abused by adults. So I would interpret this to say, let's say you have a minor, they're assaulted, their test result shows that they have a gonorrhea or chlamydia infection, and then let's say you test them again in a week and you don't find it anymore. What do you do? I mean, I, I can comment a little bit about it. Um, you know, there was, um, there was a randomized controlled trial looking at rectal chlamydia. I don't know about gonorrhea. Um, but there was a uh, randomized controlled trial comparing doxycycline to azithromycin for rectal chlamydia. This was done, um, it was published in 2020. And um, among the participants in that study who, in order to be included, you had to have rectal chlamydia diagnosed and then you were brought back for enrollment within four weeks. Um, and I know that about 20%, I want to say, of people who were eligible for the study did clear the rectal, gon the rectal chlamydia on their own within four weeks, meaning that when they came back and they were tested again, um, the NAT was negative. So it was a NAT um, test. And, um, you know, so it can happen. Um, it's, it happens in a minority of times for chlamydia. And again, this is only in the rectum, not in the urethra or the uh, vagina. Um, so it's not impossible. Um, in terms of in terms of assault, um, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure um, you know if the question really is about do we treat them anyway, um, which is what it might sound like um, for you know one thing that that's also important to consider just in the um, in the context of assault is that this past year in 2021, 
uh, the CDC STI treatment guidelines updated their sexual assault section to include um, MSM and males. Um, and specifically, if you have a patient who has been sexually assaulted, um, it's important to do extra genital testing if there have been exposures, whether or not that was part of the assault event. Um, so in other words, if you have somebody who's an MSM who's coming in for an assault event and then you ask them about their sexual history generally, um, it's recommended that if they, for example, if they've performed oral sex, you screen them for gonorrhea and chlamydia in the pharynx. If they've had receptive anal sex, then you do rectal screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, so that's another way you could think about this with the context of assault. Um, but I don't know, it's a, it's a tough question to answer. There's a lot of components. Any other thoughts from our panelists? I agree, it's a hard question to answer. We know potentially people can clear infections on their own, but it seems in my mind like you, the, the much preferred strategy would be to try to just treat these people so that you don't have to worry about whether they're gonna clear the infection on their own, especially if you're talking about like young people and as you mentioned, potential complications of upper reproductive tract complications. Yeah infertility, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Okay. And with all that said, we are right at time. So I want to thank our panelists again for being here and especially to the audience for attending our webinar today. We hope it was um, helpful for you and we hope to see you again at our next one. Thank you.